Maybe no? No, 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 but enough. So the That's it. Perfect. Okay. All right. I hope everything works now. So I hope you can see me. Uh, at least the people in the room can see me. That's for sure. Um, there is a problem. No. Okay. Um, so then, <laughs> I would like to start. Um, thank you very much for hosting us here in this wonderful location in the Botanical Garden of um, uh, Artvin of the Congo University. Um, we are very happy to be here and to have our, our workshop here today. Uh, and I'm especially grateful that we have so many particip participants joining. I didn't expect that, but of course we are very happy to share um, our, our science, our, our research with the wider um, uh, audience. So um, to all of you, uh, many thanks for, for being here, um, and especially those who are um, with us on this um, research and sampling um, trip that we have been doing before. So we have uh, a couple of hard field, day, field days uh, behind us, and um, now we are looking forward to have this scientific exchange before we came here to, to this place today. Um, I will now briefly um, or I would like to have a brief um, round of introduction first, um, and then afterwards briefly talk about the program because there's some there are some changes, um, and then I think we can start right away with the first presentation. Um, so maybe we could start our uh, introduction round with those who are actually presenting, but it would also be nice if those who are not presenting could say a sentence or two about who they are and um, why they have been joining today. Um, so I will just start right away um, with me, and then I will go to the um, present presenters for today, and then the other participants. All right. So um, my name is Lea Schneider. I'm from uh, Germany, from Gießen University. I'm from the Department of Geography, um, and I'm uh, a dental climatologist, a dental chronologist, and for those who haven't worked with dental chronology yet. Um, dental chronology is basically a method to um, date tree rings. And with these tree rings, with these dated tree rings, we can um, do a lot of different things in different um, scientific fields. Like, for example, in climatology, we can use tree rings for reconstructing climate, but we can also use them in more ecological um, um, research questions um, in dental ecological studies. And we're going to hear about all of this today in our workshop. We have a wide range of different topics, all related to tree rings. Um, and that's why the workshop today is called Dental Chronology in the Caucasus. So we're going to look a little bit at what's has, what has been done here in this region, also in Georgia, in the higher Caucasus, um, and what, what are our plans for the future. Um, yes, I'm hosting this, um, this conference today together with um, the Botanical Garden um, that we're visiting now. Um, and I'm very happy that we have four presentations, if all goes well, um, <laughs> um, from four different countries. Um, so we are very international today. Um, and we'll start with uh, local, basically. <laughs> um, so I give the word to Mehmet, who will introduce himself. Ah, wait, you can just now introduce yourself, oh, okay. and then the presentation is in the next round. So just say a couple of words about yourself, who you are, and um, then you can give the word to Dali. Ah, yeah, okay. Uh, I'm uh, associate professor from the University of the Department. Uh, I research on allergography, the dendrochronology, uh, and short uh, Yeah. Okay, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> you want to yeah. go on? Yeah, so I'm Dario Martin Benito from uh, Mia in Spain. It's a 
first thing, and I go to our research institution. And I'm in the. Can we turn it? Yeah. <laughs> um, can you check what the people are seeing? Mm -hmm. No. <laughs> Not really. Functional ecology group. So I'm at the first uh, the functional ecology group at the uh, Forest Research Institute in Guinea, and we do anything from dendrochronology to ecophysiology and metabolomics and many other things. But my focus is in dendroecology and dendrochronology and a bit of dendrochronology, but not much, but mostly dendroecology. And I've been focusing on old growth forests for the last few years and I'll present something. Um, we will continue with Rupes. So, very good, good morning to all of you. My name is Rupes Tani, and I belong to the mountain region of the Indian Himalaya. So, basically, my I already did some research work on the dendrochronology of, uh, of the Himalayas, and recently I have joined the Justice League University uh, under Professor Sinaiter. And I'm working on recently on um, dendrochronology of the Kosakas region, and it is like a home to me because this I've seen the similar mountain ranges in the Caucasus ranges also. So I look forward to a great and fruitful discussion ahead today. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, maybe you can continue okay. because there are also some people that are like okay. Tunshai. <laughs> My name is Özgür Eminoğlu. I am studying the Dakin Shuri University. Uh, I am a botanist. At the same time, I am uh, manager of the Botanical Garden. Uh, thank you very, very much for your good organization. Uh, I hope you will have a very good time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, maybe you could also, you want someone to introduce yourself briefly? Just say your names, maybe. I am uh, Shebra Saidoglu. Uh, I work in Akinjo uh, University uh, with Özgür uh, Hoca. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. My name is Can Roj I am a research assistant uh, in Akinjo University in Bota, in Bota. Okay. Uh, Thank you. Perfect one. Thank you. Um, and maybe Tunja and Nezibe, if you hear us, could you also please? Yes, good morning everyone. I'm hearing you, Leah. I'm Tunja Güner and from Istanbul University, Cerrah Pasha Forest Faculty. Uh, I first would thank to Özgür Hoca and Artin Çoru University to hosting this workshop and organize this. Hello to everyone. Uh, good morning, everybody. It is very nice to see you for a long time later. Uh, I hope you had. Hey, Dario. <laughs> uh, I have. I hope you had good time in Artvin, and I would like to thank you, uh, Özgür Hoca, uh, for hosting all of us and for this opportunity to uh, to organize a meeting in a very short time. And for all your uh, present, uh, for, for all your uh, the scientists who is going to present uh, today, uh, I think everybody knows us. Uh, we are working together with Tunjai and Unal, and uh, we had a long time research in Artvin uh, region. And it, today it is very uh, nice to share our results and new ideas. Uh, to get with you uh, in this meeting. Thank you very much again. And you know now. Hocam, microphone kapalı. Hello, everybody. Good morning. And welcome to Turkey. And I wish you a very nice meeting. And also, 
I thank you so much, uh, my friend uh, Özgür Hoca, for for this opportunity. Thank you. <laughs> That's okay. 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 Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, all right. I don't know the participants. Is there anybody who we should introduce? Anybody wants to introduce himself, himself, herself? Okay. Okay. Um, if not, I would like to say a couple of words of the program for today. Um, okay. I hope you can see this now. Um, that's okay. <laughs> okay, so our program for today um, mainly consists of uh, four presentations. Um, the, there's a, a little bit of a change in the, uh, in the schedule. So we're going to get the presentation from Mehmet first. And then um, we have to um, skip the next one because the presenter uh, got stuck at the, at the border. So he couldn't make it this morning, but I hope he will be here in the afternoon. Um, so that's why Dario will present as a, sec a second before lunch. Then we're going to have a lunch break. And in the afternoon, um, hopefully, we're going to get to listen to um, the Leva's presentation and then um, uh, in the end um, to Rupert's presentation. Um, and for each of the presentations, we have a lot of time for um, questions and discussions. So please um, actively listen and ask questions um, if you want to afterwards. Um, there's plenty for room, of room planned for that. Um, and in the end, we are going to have a closing session um, and some discussion about potential future collaborations. All right. Um, yeah, I think that was um, what I wanted to say here. Um, I think I can pass over to Mehmet. Um, we're going to need probably one or two minutes to get the presentation running, and then we will start right into this presentation. Huh? I'm finished. Here I would like to have it full screen, uh, yes, I'm not in this window. I 
closing your screen? I full screen here, I would expect that it also changes to full screen in yours. Can you save it as a video? No, it's not. I was going to change it once. Maybe I will open it in. Do you already share the screen? I could use this. Yeah. yeah. But not the full screen. Not the full screen. No. Right? I can do it like I did before, but. Can you share and share it? Does it give you an option? I think it changed the screen. Yep, and it's Does that work? Yeah. And does it work when you go when you move to the next? Does it change as you decide? Okay, you want to go? You want to sit here? Just my English not very well. But <laughs> then I will. Sorry. Sorry for that. The camera I can turn towards you because uh, we don't need this on the. Not necessary, I think. <laughs> I think <Thank> yes. <laughs> I'm not very handsome. <laughs> Hi, everybody, again. Uh, Today, I want to present you a uh, part of the work he uh, did on the beach trees uh, meeting the border of the Arjun Provence. And Dario uh, Martin Benetton is back to a Neil Peterson, Joy Binner, and I have been doing gender project studies in temporary trade forest uh, for the long time. Uh, however, uh, after uh, 219, uh, I, unfortunately, I couldn't divide enough time to work uh, in this region due to um, my back kind of work plan. That's why uh, today I will give you a brief presentation on the result of my uh, previous studies on the beach. Uh, so, uh, in this slide, uh, 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 of course, so, uh, from a study, uh, for example, in this event, I um, and you know, work in this area also. Uh, from studies, they have found that beach trees are highly sensitive to climate uh, variability. You can see on the slides. Right. And uh, in this slide, you see two different information on the map. Uh, blue dots show meteorological station in Eastern Black Sea region and its surrounding. Uh, the points show with different geometric uh, sharps and colors of the area we sampled uh, in the Eastern Black Sea region. Uh, and the three species we sampled in this region. So uh, uh, today uh, I will only present to you the relationship uh, relationship with, uh, between terrific wind and climate uh, temperature and 
presentation, of course, in uh, four different areas, meet the border of the Artem Provence and the similarity and differences between them. Uh, I think yeah, nobody knows uh, description of uh, Oracle Beach, but I want also uh, some information about the history. Uh, Oriental Beach is an important forest tree that covers a wide area in northern Turkey. Also, uh, the beach is a tourist species. Uh, what happened? Okay, a species difference uh, distributes. What happened? Yeah. Okay. 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 No, everybody. Yeah, yeah. Amanas Mountains in Turkey and uh, in the Caucasus outside of Turkey and south of the uh, Hazar Sea, north of the Hazar Sea. Uh, so, uh, Oriental Beach is dominant species of the weather areas in the uh, Caucasus Mountains in. Uh, North is uh, uh, Mountains, mountain. yeah. where they are here. Yeah. Uh, so, for analyze uh, in this research, we used uh, four three beach terrain chronology taken from the art bin, uh, and this chronology is were built from the samples taken different areas and uh, different elevation. Uh, in this slide, you can see information such as number of theories and samples taken in each region. Uh, the period uh, this chronology is co covered and location and the area characters of our uh, where we take samples. Uh, when we look the crunchy lot, it can be seen uh, the tree are crunchy up to uh, 474 years old. And when uh, we use general general crunchy method to create the crunchy, and uh, discipline uh, function method was used to standardize the technologies. For this, we use ARSEN program. Uh, in this slide, you can see the link index after the standardization and number of uh, course together. Uh, Pearson correlation analysis method was used to determine the relationship between the annual ring light and climate. Uh, temperature and uh, precipitation values from Artvin and Hopa medical station varies as a climate data for analysis. Uh, monthly total uh, precipitation and monthly average and maximum minimum temperature was in the period of July to progress year to October of the reformation year of uh, various as independent variables. And annual rainforest was used as dependent variable. Uh, for this, we use uh, the decline program. Uh, also, we use uh, Palmer grass sensitivity index uh, was used to determine the effect of droughts on annual rainfall and the response of the trees to drought. So, and, uh, 
where in the look at the weather station climate data, it can be seen uh, there are different uh, in temperature and precipitation values between the coastal region uh, and uh, the inland region between the Hopa and Artin is change a lot. Uh, and if explicitly the differences in precipitation values are uh, quite significant, uh, while the average annual state, uh, total uh, precipitation in coastal region is among 2,300 millimeter, uh, it's uh, around uh, 700 millimeter in the Arton meteorological station. And there is highly variability in the amount of precipitation between your in the region. Uh, there is an increase in the amount of uh, precipitation from past to uh, present. Uh, and uh, there was a slight decrease in the average of temperature. So, When we looked at the correlation between theory rings and climate, uh, the effect of precipitation on oriental beach drop at high elevation was positive in previous December, current January, and June. Uh, this positive effect was significant in January or half on site uh, region and uh, TPS in high elevation. Uh, uh, the, the effect of the precipitation is at lower uh, elevation in our site. Uh, the site is below the uh, 750 meters below the sea. Was significant negative in April and was significantly positive in June. Uh, higher temperature from May to July had a positive effect and uh, in September and October had a negative effect on uh, radial growth of oriental beach in high elevation and uh, positive effect uh, were significant in two sites from uh, May to July. Uh, and higher temperature had negative effect on radial growth of orange beach at lower elevation in May to June, uh, May and June, sorry, May and June. That effect was significant in June. Uh, and uh, in this slide also, we, we nearly saw the same result this slide show the maximum, temp maximum temperature. And in slide is show uh, minimum temperature. Uh, the effect of drought was seen at lower levels. Uh, that effect was significant uh, from May to August in lower elevation. And very quick. And then we come with uh, conclusions. Uh, the result of this study showed that oriental beach in temperature humid forests are highly sensitive to climate variability. Uh, at higher elevation, uh, low temperature in spring and summer, and all low solar radiation due to the Cloud cover are the most important limiting factor for oriental beach growth. Uh, no significant uh, relationship were found between terrain and precipitation at this altitude. Uh, this strong relationship with temperature is generally characteristic uh, of trees near at the upper uh, limit of the forest. Uh, and 
uh, at the lower altitudes, uh, there was a negative correlation between the annual ring width of Oriental Beach and May and June temperature. Uh, higher temperature in April and April or precipitation in May, June positively affected the growth of Oriental Beach. And uh, for more information, of course, we have some paper from uh, about the, uh, these areas, this region, uh, and I took four paper in the slide. If you want more information, you can check it down link and of course read. Uh, and thanks to Twitter because. And uh, support me for PhD and take you to INIA and uh, support to Dario and us a lot. And take to my university, Egg University, and thanks to Harvard University also support us and support me, Peterson. Uh, we also uh, take to general direction of course and Forestry and Borshka Artin Shafta Forest Management Directory for their assistant in fieldworks. And thank you for all you for your attention. Uh, of course, may, uh, if Dario and Nisbe want to give us more information, you are welcome. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much, Mehmet, for this very nice information and presentation. Um, I will try to make this work somehow. Okay. I don't know. Oh, that's good. Maybe okay, Mehmet. Michael, do you want to move a little bit towards Here. that view so that you are on, okay. the, on the screen? Miss, uh, make yourself a jump. <laughs> do you want to give some information? We can maybe first ask for questions oh, and of course. then we, we see who gives the information. <laughs> uh, my English must be right. Also, you can ask me. So I think yeah. All right. Um, is there any question to Mehmet or to Dario? No. Uh, no question. Just one thing. Uh, the uh, sometimes we found the signal of mean temperature during the summer season. So what? Can be the physiological explanation for that? Uh, Leo, sorry, uh, we couldn't understand the question. Could you please repeat it for us? My, uh, my question is that, um, not a question, but I just want to know that what, what is the physiological basis for the positive response to tree growth during the summer season? Maybe it's good to so jump explain. Dario hala anlayamıyorum. Ben duyamadım buradan. Hiç şey soruyor. I I couldn't understand the question exactly. Could you please explain again? Maybe Leo, because it is far. Dario, I just came to you. Can you hear me? Can you hear me well? Hello, Nesibe. Sorry. Can you hear me? Coming. I I can hear you, Dario. Maybe you can, you can give the answer, but I couldn't understand the question I'll, yet. I'll repeat, I'll repeat it. I think it may be better if we repeat the questions when we're closer to the computer. So I think what Rupesh was uh, um, asking was, what's the physiological explanation for the positive correlation between tree growth and summer temperature? Was that it? Yeah. yeah. Should I, or? Yeah, you can, you can. All right, so the thing is this uh, QPS site, it's, I'll, I'll present something more about it. It's a very high elevation 
uh, I think about 1800, between, oh, seven, between cool. 17 and 1900, basically. So uh, the trees are starting to grow later when it's um, cold, and they grow slower because they have uh, probably two factors. Photosynthesis is slowed by lower temperature, and the cambial activity is also slowed down by lower temperature. Basically the same thing that limits any uh, tree line or timber line trees. Uh, the same thing, plus these trees uh, are evergreen, so they need to put new leaves every year. And then if that is um, delayed by cold temperatures, I would say, especially at the beginning of the season, of course, after the trees have the leaves, then that is not a factor anymore. Uh, and I'll show, um, and it shows here, May, see it's, a, it's, it's probably the most important signal. That's when the trees are probably, but uh, I'm not an expert, because I don't know, I've never been, I've been here in May and the trees have no leaves, but I don't know if that was just that one year that it snowed a lot and we couldn't go to Jamily. Um, but uh, my take is like trees are flushing around that time of the year, so around May or something, because they are there pretty late. And also the so it's slower in the... So it's the three factors. But this is uh, late uh, flushing of the trees and slow cambium activity. But we won't know that. Very... Yeah, but it's it's May and June. I mean, then in then July, it stops because it's... I would say mostly for the one, anyway. Um, maybe relate, related to this, do you have an explanation for the low signal from the highest side, basically? So the uh, first side, the KAF, uh, this doesn't show a good temperature correlate, or the, uh, the, the lower comfort correlation. Yeah, we use uh, medical recognition station from that data. So maybe uh, we need to use um, data from uh, I, I, I crew or not? Not crew. Maybe um, oh, um, at a fine uh -huh. land data. I, 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 I want to analyze this from that data. Maybe we can uh, take a good idea also. Yeah. Maybe we need to change our planet data. Probably, I mean, that could make, I mean, you see the topography here, it's yeah. very variable. Yeah. So whether you're on one side of the mountain or the other, it can change. So it might not only be the temperature, but what comes with temperature, which may be cloud cover. And so if you're facing the Black Sea wind, coming with all the humidity, then not only it's cold, but it's also darker because you have so much fog. So I think maybe more complex than just the temperature itself. Plus, it's important to know that, like, like you showed in the map, these uh, sites are not in a gradient along the same slope, so there are many other factors that can be changing. Can you go back to the map? Because I'd like to see where this KIF site is compared to the others. I didn't, uh, I, I wasn't fast uh, enough to see that. We also have uh, three uh, more chronology. Can you finish the measurement? Uh, I'll show where another. Where's the, the map? Yeah. Okay. So Cap is just above here somewhere. Yeah. And then Gorgi and QPS are really facing the Choru Valley. It's not Choru, but that you see that northwest, north, uh, southeast. Uh, I also want to do that one. I also want to do another. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. I mean, Nessie, they got the calf, right? Uh, yeah. Site. Also, we have three more uh, site It's example. It's finished. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. Those know. are finished, I think. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, we, have, we have seven technology uh, from uh, Arctic province. Mm -hmm. uh, which technology? What? What I also, what might also be interesting is that um, the seasonality of temperature is different as you go further away from the sea, so it gets warmer 
uh, earlier if you're away from the sea and if you're at the sea it takes a bit longer to warm up because the sea is cold I guess during winter it would be nice to see if this is somehow translated into the, into the phonology of the trees and check whether the climate signals um, whether you can still see this difference in temperature seasonality you know what I mean <laughs> 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 um, so the sites that are closer to the plexi, yes. mm -hmm. they will probably get warmer later in the year because yeah. the sea, sea surface temperature mm. is still low. I, that was actually visible from the climate diagrams that you showed. But and other three uh, uh, sites no. not. Mm. So the Hoppa site warms up later than the Artwin site or meteorological station. Mm -hmm. It might be even possible possible to see this in the temperature signal from the trees mm -hmm. that they are a little bit shifted in their seasonality. That would be cool. <laughs> I think you can probably see something like that in uh, dendrometer data mm. or cell density data that are yeah. more yeah, uh, time, uh, ben, time ben, scale ben, is yeah, finer. Yeah. Could be something to test with, with a really well defined gradient, like transamic continuality gradient or something. Yeah. But it's also important, I think, to see how precipitation is. Yeah. So, <laughs> <laughs> so high in Hopa, but it's really low in the very early, yeah, very low, but lower in spring. Yeah, it's really crazy that trees. it's like shifted. I mean, the maximum is almost at the minimum from here. So. Yeah. <laughs> wow, this is crazy. So there's a lot of, you know, it's not so simple because there's so many factors playing out. That's what makes it interesting. That's really why interesting. I was talking about temperature because. <laughs> <laughs> Let's not get too long. Can you guys online hear us? Anybody there? Uh, Dario. Yes. All the uh, all your sentences was not clear for me, uh, but I can say that at the higher elevation, it receives a very high amount of precipitation. Uh, because of that, uh, there isn't any precipitation problem, even if in the summertime. Uh, I mean, there is not so many drought there because of that higher temperatures and uh, leads to um, uh, take more uh, uh, photosynthesis for the for the species because of that the the rings get, uh, getting wider there uh, because it receives uh, more rain. And now more temperature, if temperature is getting higher, uh, the photosynthesis amount is uh, getting bigger uh, for this species in at the higher elevations because of that there is a, uh, um, a positive correlation, I guess, at the higher elevations with temperature. Uh, but also I would like to add uh, something more about this Caucasus region. Maybe uh, we have to summarize, maybe you can help me uh, much uh, for that region. Uh, we had another uh, publication about disturbances and also all the species, uh, how climate change affect or climate affect uh, the species at the Caucasus region, at the end, what we found, uh, there wasn't any distribution, big distribution, uh, not distribution, a disturbance effect uh, on uh, Fagus in Jamile, for example, and uh, Pisea. Uh, this area is very unique for Turkey, this Caucasus region for uh, Georgia too, uh, because we know that uh, today, uh, the species benefit uh, climate change, increasing temperature, and uh, slightly increasing from slightly increasing precipitation. Uh, this area is very important for Turkey and uh, for the uh, Europe, I think, because uh, we also uh, see that uh, in the future proje projection, for example, for Fagus, 
I would like to share my screen uh, for you the uh, uh, to, to, to add more information if I can do this. Okay, I wanna show only one uh, figure for you. Uh, okay, let's see if I can do it. I'm getting older, Dario, disabled to share oh. screen. Could you please help me? I don't know. If I am getting older, you are getting older too, Dario. I'm only getting younger. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can't believe that. <laughs> no, disabled. Can I try again? No. There's younger people here that knows how to work a computer. That's great. Okay. I, uh, now I can share. Okay. Uh, this area, Caucasus region, is very important because in the past, uh, it was a refugia uh, for the species. Uh, now... Uh, wait, wait a second. Uh, could you could you please uh, full screen your the, the or that zoom, file or zoom it? Ah, okay. Like that? Yeah. Ah, okay. Uh, in the past, it was a refugia for the species because it didn't affect it so much for this um, uh, past uh, climate changes. But uh, also today we know that our research actually, all the research more than 10 years, I guess, uh, showed us uh, the species didn't affect it too much, uh, affected negatively from climate change because this area is very unique in Turkey because of the lake effect of uh, the uh, Black Sea region. Uh, so uh, this area is very important. Uh, for the future, our future projections, for for example, for Fagus Orientalis also show that um, all the uh, areas, distribution area from Turkey and the other regions uh, for Fagus Orientalis, uh, they will, they expect, expected that uh, there will no uh, Fagus Orientalis uh, in the other areas in Turkey, except Caucasus region. Uh, it is on the uh, pessimistic or optimistic vote uh, or moderate uh, scenarios show the similar things. Uh, I can say that we don't believe the models, but it, uh, it is a sign, it is a tendency to look at the models uh, also uh, in, uh, to make a uh, summary, I can say that during research showed us uh, in the Caucasus region, trees cannot affect uh, badly from climate change till now. And also projections from some species, for example, for Focus Orientalis shows that this can be a refugia in the future for the species too. Because of that, it is really very important to avoid uh, the fragmentations or the uh, cutting old growth trees. This is very important. Uh, our research finally showed us. Uh, it is very important to uh, talk about our colleagues. Uh, this issue, I'm always telling them, don't touch the old growth, growth forest in the Caucasus region. Uh, but, you know, it is not easy uh, to... Uh, in reality, they are cutting the forest in that area too. Uh, so uh, I can I can say that uh, we have to be uh, we maybe it is needed more research in that area for the other species or for other uh, researchers in that area than the chronological based or the model based researchers uh, to uh, support the idea uh, more. Uh, maybe, uh, Dario, you can add some more uh, information about previous researches in that area for all the species or uh, the, the disturb disturbance the re regimes in that area. Yeah, I will I will present something about the Jamnili forest. Mm -hmm. so, the old growth forest there. 
it's, I hope it's still there that they haven't loved it yet. <laughs> I don't want to go just in case. Um, I have another question to, to you, Mehmet. Um, so in the beginning of your presentation, you showed this very impressive network of um, beach sampling network that you have beach samples, beach sites mm -hmm. that you have sampled. Um, and it was actually far beyond the distribution range that we were now looking at, which was basically only the coastal region. But you have sampled beaches basically over almost the whole country. Are these trees planted at these places? Because this, this was probably the natural distribution range, but if the trees are growing outside, then these are planted trees or how is no. it? Do you remember any places uh, arranged for which no, we are no. not? No, all of I don't know what, what I'm trying to look for your presentation. What? Um, it's, what, what is it? it's gone. It's Maybe off. it was a problem with the USB stick. Oh, right. I thought this was your network because the okay the color looks yeah, yeah. a little bit different. <laughs> oh, yeah, <I> <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Is there any other question to Mehmet? Yes. It's not showing the presentation. Oh, I don't know why. Because um, the uh, stock is now in sharing. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> Didn't I do that? Yeah. That did not allow. Huh? Okay. Okay, then um Dario left, that's perfect. Let me see what I think of this presentation. The one from PowerPoint? Uh, probably PDF works better. There'll be some problems with. Stand and you have make a bigger answer. No, I'll, I'll stand. It's perfect. Can you see it? Yeah, yeah. Turn around this one. Ah, no, I can, I can do it. Yeah.
Is it possible to see on? I mean, are you guys seeing on, on Zoom? Yeah, yeah. People can see it online. Yeah. Yes. All right. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm gonna, oh, yeah, I'm going to stand here. So take this. So, all right, so just so I probably go over time, but it's just then. Um, so continue with what uh, Nesiba was. That I'm going to talk a bit more about the forest ecology of the old growth and mature forests and how stability, um, disturbances, and climate end up shaping these ecosystems and the carbon accumulation in them. Uh, I'm going to use three examples that we've been working in the, over the last few years. One of them is from the Caucasus here, and two are from uh, Spain. One is an oak forest and the other one is also a beech conifer, which can be, it's not comparable, of course, because a different species, different climate, but it's something related to what we have here in Germany. So when we, oh, there you go. So when we talk about old growth forest, uh, the problem is, first thing is, how do we define old growth forest? And the question is, we don't know. It's always uh, a really hard thing to define. Uh, because all growth forests are different, whether if you are on a um, juniper forest like that, or if you're in a closed rain, uh, temperate rainforest like here, or you're in a pine forest. So the definitions probably wouldn't work in different, different uh, conditions. So now in the US, they have a big project or a big effort to map their all growth forest. And these people have been working there for a long time and they still don't know exactly where the old growth forests are. So I don't think any country is expected to know exactly where all the old growth forest is. But I think it's good to start doing research on this field. So at least these old growth, the whatever little areas of old growth forest are left are protected and they're not logged and they're um, so, or even they can be increased by protecting sites that are not old growth but are pretty close to that. So, um, so when you see the what the, um, different uh, ages for old growth, we can see well, yeah, it's pretty much uh, old, 400, 500 years old. That's uh, sometimes easy to understand. But when you see uh, the range uh, to define old growth forest, it goes to 150 in some some ecosystems, 150 to 500 years. So we don't know. We go to the forest, we sample some trees, we get ages, and we really don't know if it's an old growth forest or not, right? So there may be something else than age, but there's really not much more. I mean, we can do a lot of other things, but um, it's it's just not one index. One index is just not going to give you all the information at once. Although there's, uh, some people have been working on it, but I'm not so convinced. So uh, it was already proposed uh, many years ago that a single precise definition of old growth forest Applicable to all four types is neither possible nor desirable because we will miss some things. If we try to apply the all growth forest definition from here to here, of course, this will never be an all growth forest. And the same way around, if we use this definition there, it won't work, that definition here, it won't work, so we won't know what all growth forest is. But good thing is, I'm limited to temperate humid forests, so the definition pretty much uh, works in the end. And the definition is we end up having. Uh, so uh, the structure, the diameter uh, distribution, we also look at um, age distributions. We look at the maximum age. And um, they have to have a minimum extent as well to be considered uh, uh, so to be considered all growth, because we are defining all growth forests, are those forests where natural disturbances are dominating and humans are not interfering or have not interfered in the past a lot. And that a lot is really hard to define too. Because of course, uh, CO2 is increasing, it's affecting forest, and we are uh, causing that. Um, uh, racing has, uh, by, by natural, uh, by um, wild ungulates, deer, roe deer, uh, whatever, uh, they have, of course, population have been 
shifted because we have been hunting them. So there's a lot of influences that we're not considering, but at least that we have not built roads, that people have not been cutting or burning these, these places. But of course, hum uh, humans and earlier hominids have been affecting forest pretty much everywhere. I mean, new research shows that in the Amazon forest, there have been um, effects from humans. And if they, there's an effect there in the Amazon forest, that probably affects everywhere. Um, so these are some of the forests that we've been working on, and the Kolchik forest as, uh, here, I think it probably has like the widest range in temperature and precipitation of all the, like combined of all the, of all the pesticides that we've been working on. So one thing that we look at on, uh, when we are talking about uh, old growth forest, so this is kind of like an old definition because climate climate assumes that we are to reach at a certain time, like I don't know, 300, 400, 10,000 years later, we can reach the perfect state of the forest. But the perfect state of the forest doesn't exist because it's always changing. So it's a dynamic equilibrium from when we have, like we had a clear cut to when the trees are, are growing. Uh, one of the thing is, so, um, and I'm, because I'm going to be focusing on, on biomass, is we have the living uh, biomass in the forest accumulates from, say, a clear cut or a fire or a big disturbance towards the later stages of more mature forests. But it reaches maximum much before we reach that dynamic equilibrium in the, at the end. And in part, it's because we have more species in that part, that they, so we can have more trees growing more at that, uh, at that uh, stage. Later on, for example, those uh, sun, sun loving or shade intolerant species will disappear, so they're not really contributing to that, that biomass there. So when we think about the carbon cycle, we think uh, photosynthesis is coming in, it accumulates, and it leads to disturbances and uh, then later the decomposition. Uh, uh, natural uh, potential net potential uh, productivity can be divided in different uh, different blocks in the in the forest, but that's really not so so important. The thing is, so not, nothing not, nothing more complicated than a bucket with holes, and we put carbon in and we take carbon out, and the ratio between what we put in and what we put out, um, um, it's what we are holding in the forest. It's really something simple. Um, I'm going to skip that about the. No, 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 no. Um, so the thing is, sometimes the old growth forests are considered to not be accumulating any more carbon because the balance between what comes in and what comes up is the same, or it's less coming in than going out. But there are more uh, and more uh, more uh, studies and, and, and publications that show that that is not true. That old growth forests can still accumulate. Um, uh, biomass and carbon, either in the dead wood uh, uh, pool or in the still in the living trees. And um, about so we're talking about these long-term dynamics, right? Sometimes when we go there, we see the picture, but we don't know what happened before, and that's usually the problem. With this is a great paper, by the way. So, uh, so when we're we study this part and say, yeah, it's rising. We don't know if it's part of the cycle, if it's been flat and now it's increasing, or what has happened, right? So that's sometimes what, uh, say, forest inventories can give us sometimes this information, but then technology can give us more information to the past so we can understand better the response of these, of these forests. And sometimes they give us the same information, sometimes it's complementary information, and sometimes it's opposite. What we find with forest inventories, for example, and um, dendro chronology. So, when I'm talking about dendro ecology, it's the use of, like uh, Miguel was saying, the use of tree rings, like precisely dated tree rings. We assign size calendar year to every ring, and then we can infer uh, either climate or ecological information from them. Uh, two of the main uh, uh, Results we can we can uh, obtain from that. We can know, of course, when the tree regenerated. And by regenerated, we it's not when it started uh, uh, germinating, but when it reached uh, point height, 
might be uh, around a meter, a meter thirty from the from the ground, and then we can use that for age distributions, or we can see where when this tree was released, so all the trees or some of the trees or branches around it uh, died or were damaged, and this tree got more light and it could use it to, to grow more and we can date these, these releases. So basically we can rate we can date uh, when the tree reached 130 or of growing height and when it got open in the in the canopy. And so we put that information, uh, regeneration and this for many trees, and we can get this kind of uh, this kind of graphs where we see periods of higher disturbances and periods of low disturbances. Periods of high disturbances there and lower disturbances and disturbances there. Or we can see where when the trees were regenerating, we can see these big uh, spikes of regeneration, or we can see continuous regeneration with this basically apart from like small sticks, which may not be representative, just a three or four uh, trees being uh, regen regenerated there, we can see different patterns in this uh, forest. And I think these two sites, and I'll explain a bit more later, they look very, very different. And so, oh, that's um, So, and something else we can do is because we have ring width and we have our metric equations that relate DBH to above ground biomass, we can reconstruct biomass of the tree back in time with a lot of error that it's really hard to estimate how much, but at least we have some way of trying to estimate how big the trees were back then. And of course, the trees that are here now, uh, the trees that died, we can get the last maybe 20, 30 years, but not much more than that. So, if a tree died 300 years ago, of course, it was accumulating biomass for the forest, but we, we, we were not there to sample it, so we can't. But at least we can see what the biomass has, of these trees has been in the last uh, 100, hundreds of years. And we can combine the forest inventory data, hydroecology, and dynamic vegetation models. Basically, dynamic vegetation models are a set of equations that just uh, or uh, simulate from the uh, germination of the of the trees to the death of the trees. And the good thing is, so, so it's establishment, growth, and then mortality, but both establishment uh, affect growth, growth affects mortality, and it, 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 it feeds back all the time like that. So if a tree, for example, in this model that I was using, if a tree is growing, very slowly for three or four years, then it, the probability of it dying increases. And um, if the trees are growing a lot, like one species is growing a lot, it can shade another species that will later um, disappear from the landscape. So we can somehow simulate um, how the trees, uh, how, the, how the forest would look like if we were not there in a way. Apart from Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. I think you can. Oh, right. So, and this is what it looks like uh, when we do the random simulation for, for a thousand years. So we start with no trees, but some soil, of course, it's not a square rock. And we run it through a uh, thousand years. We see at the beginning there's a lot of species. And some species that are here, they may later disappear, like this red uh, red oak.
So the um, yeah, we can simulate the species how they change, and then we can see, as I was saying before, how the maximum biomass uh, is the first. It's usually beach um, when uh, the higher or a more diverse pool of, of species uh, in the in the forest, and then here we can see that some of them uh, dominate, which were probably not uh, present before, and we can see uh, well, some species most most. Most of the times, they're less exceptional shade tolerant species that can withstand the shade from uh, their same species, so, so from individuals from the same species of the same species and individuals of uh, different species. Hmm. Oh. All right, so I'll, for, and um, I'll skip that too, but no, sorry. So, so what I just wanted to say is, like I was saying before, there's no climax of mm -hmm. vegetation, even though it's a good concept to understand what we would expect here under this climate and this disturbance regime. It's not um, kind of like a, it's not a destination. It's a process that continues endlessly, and it's not linear. So, in most textbooks, uh, we have, we most of the times have it. Linear, so it stands from the standard, starts from standard phasing disturbances. There was this kind of like a small gap disturbances, which is what we find here, as I would say. But it's not like it can go back to here and then be back again here. It might go from here to here and then from here, from that uh, partial disturbance, and like a mix, it can go somewhere else. So it's not so linear, it's more of a n dimensional. I don't know if you remember how uh, those balls, uh, these. Uh, uh, veins work into the other ball, but it's really hard to predict where it's going to go. It, even though it's really similar to uh, the trajectory, very similar to previous uh, trajectories, it may change because of many other things. The same thing with this, um, uh, with our trajectories. We may be here, but then it can divert uh, to many other options, and then it can go from there to somewhere else, and we may never get back to what we were, to where we were before. And that is particularly important in this uh, time of climate change because. Um, previous disturbances had some effect when it was a degree colder and it was maybe wetter or drier. But right now, these are these disturbances that are happening now. The effect will be different in the future because there's higher CO2 and species will respond differently to increase CO2. There's more uh, temp there's higher temperature, so it shouldn't be understood as a linear uh, trajectory, which is really hard. It, it, it's really easy to use that for um, to, to have some kind of mental uh, Map in a way, but uh, we should be open to to other interpretations. So getting to the actual things, and yes. Uh, so we're going to be presenting so uh, two examples from from Spain and one from from Turkey. So the first one is this beach forest in the western uh, Pyrenees. It's uh, Abies uh, Alba, so silver fir and uh, Fagus hepatica, so European beach. And um, it's wet, uh, so that's precipitation, temperature is wet, and it's uh, not too warm for the uh, Iberian Peninsula. But we always have this supposed to be uh, summer drought, which is not actual drought, but it's drier than some other time. And here we have some other places, sorry. So we have old growth forest and we have secondary old growth forest. So uh, old growth. It was probably never logged, never affected directly by humans. Secondary old growth, we know that uh, there are actual historical records that it was affected. But as I will show, it was like over 200 years ago. So again, we can do regeneration and release for uh, the trees that we cover in these uh, seven blocks. 
So instead of the, the way we sample these plots, instead of um, going like we did now for dental climatology, instead of just targeting all looking uh, trees that look pretty old, we sample everything in the plot so we can have better information of, from the old trees and the younger trees, the smaller trees and the bigger trees. And here, here we only have two species. So this is for the old growth, and this is for the uh, longer touch. The size of the of the dots uh, is proportional to the size of the trees. You can already see that there are fewer trees in the old growth and more trees on the touch forest, but they're smaller on the, on the touch from the old growth. All right, so we have biomass between 400 and, and 700 tons uh, per, per hectare, which is, I think, pretty decent. Uh, the distribution of uh, diameters in the old forest doesn't look what we would expect from the old forest. We would expect something like an inverted J that is in the secondary forest. So again, uh, probably the definitions of all these indices for to define old forest might not work so well. And we can do so we sample a lot of trees and then we reconstruct. Uh, basically an increment, so the area of each ring that the trees are putting, we can do it at a single tree um, level, and we see green for for fir and blue for uh, peach. And we see that fir is growing faster than peach. And we'd say, well, yeah, why is uh, fir not dominating the forest? Because when we translate that into stem level growth, we see that peach has more ingredients and even though they're growing less per individual, the growth of the forest is mainly dominated by, by each, uh, some other places, like in this uh, supposed to be normal touch forest, uh, are uh, um, So at fur, it's growing a bit more uh, at, the, at the stand level than, than it at the uh, old growth forest. Uh, disturbances, again, old growth, so it's mostly dominated by low, um, uh, disturbances, they are only affected about 10 to 20 percent of the trees every decade. Whereas at the long and touch forest, we have these bigger uh, disturbances. And these disturbances agree very well with the oh, there's a problem with the bars there. But anyway, there's a peak of disturbance, oh sorry, of regeneration here after disturbance. And because there are really no peaks of disturbances here, there is no peaks of regeneration in the old world. So these are uh, really high. I mean, over the course of about uh, over 50 years, almost all the trees that we see, have in the forest now were affected by disturbance. And that was due to logging by some people. And funny enough, we find some uh, historical documents. I, I won't talk too much about that. And then we also run for that forest. We run uh, these uh, dynamic vegetation models. We have the old growth and again secondary. So we see Agus is dominating in both of them, but Apis is supposed to or is expected to be more growing more in the old growth forest than in the secondary forest. When we compare observed and estimated uh, basal area in this forest, we see that for the old growth forest is very similar. So that is simulated, this is uh, observed. But for the old, for the secondary forest, because it has been disturbed by humans, it's a bit more off. And actually, fur is overrepresented in that forest. It has more fur actually than it should have if we were not affected, we, we had not affected this forest. So, same thing here, uh, we can compare growth of and growth of beach. Uh, so what we observe and what we simulate, and again, it's overrepresented. It's overrepresented right now. Our take is that because um, historical logging has favored silver fur against what we would expect. We, silver fur is supposed to be really shade tolerant, and it would not supposed to be responding to these higher disturbances, but it has. So what we see now as a growth decline in these forests may be just a recovery from all disturbances. So we have increased the amount of fur in places where it should not be, or it should not 
he, so, there should not be so much silver fur. And now nature is claiming back what we took from it. And now beach is doing better and silver is declining in these forests. All right, so this is the Jamili forest changing to the Caucasus. The annual precipitation, of course, uh, uh, 3,000 somewhere, uh, 4,000 in, in Georgia in some places. And we collected this site here uh, in the reserve, uh, high precipitation, low temperatures in the winter. We wouldn't have data from there, but uh, combining several metro stations and using lapse rates for uh, mountains with similar um, climate, we, we estimated the climate at that, at that uh, site. And so we sample here, uh, we have five plots, and it has a bit less of biomass that we had in the Pyrenees, but around uh, three to 600 uh, tons per hectare, which is a lot. Here we have Fagus orientalis again, and these are in Thales, Padus is growing much more, but again, per hectare. So when we're translating that, so the growth of individuals and the number of individuals combined, we have uh, that beach, it's uh, dominating the, the forest. Uh, about different, uh, that. And again, we can we can do uh, releases and we can see, well, major and minor, minor releases, some, don't so much as a, well, these are minor releases, these are major releases. So we can see in some places it really looks like striking how the tree, after being suppressed for over 150 years, if you re re release it from competition, it can go up again. Uh, again, we don't see too much, uh, too many disturbances at any point in time. I mean, again, between 10 and 20 at most, most of the times. Um, that's for spruce, that's for, um, uh, for no, sorry, for, for beach, that's for spruce. And again, the regeneration has some small peaks, although uh, there's a problem with that figure. So. And um, so uh, the trees are, so when they're, when they're being released, they can change from uh, suppressed to uh, intermediate, to predominant, to dominant. But usually trees, uh, some, so some trees have never been released. No single release, and they can be most of, most of the times, of course, in the in the suppressed uh, so in the suppressed canopy layer. And some dominant trees have never been released, so maybe they have just uh, like slowly been um, reaching the, the higher the higher canopy. But sometimes we see trees that have been released four or five times, and they're still not there. So it, it's a really slow process that these forests take to these trees take to go up and down. Higher canopy, so where they where they can get more light. Even sometimes we can have uh, 22 missing rings because these trees are so suppressed in a period of 30 years. So if this tree didn't grow at all on in, this, in the stem for 22 years or 22 years, we don't exactly what years, but these are the nasty rings that we have to deal with in, in this uh, record, and we have from um, most most. Samples don't have any, any missing rings, and some have to like 20 missing rings, and that's a. But that's a good thing of using some suppressed trees as well, because there's a, a lot of information in this this uh, in this series. And this tree is 300 years old when we got it, and it didn't grow for 20 years. It didn't care. I mean, it's still here with us, and it was growing really well. Something happened. It didn't grow so well, and it's still perfectly alive. And. Uh, Complementing a bit what uh, Mehmet was presenting, we run some kind of growth correlations between uh, precipitation, maximum temperature, uh, average temperature, and minimum temperature in uh, beech and, and spruce. So max temperature in spruce has a um, positive correlation here at the beginning of the, of the season. And then funny enough, it drops really Almost yeah, to some negative values. Not, uh, uh, no, that was significant. But then, and then it goes up again. And Pagus is going exactly the opposite. So it takes up in May, when we leave, of course. And it, then it doesn't hurt so much. Uh, although they are higher, like Mehmet was showing, they're higher later on. So what the take is from that, 
it's and sorry, and combining so the positive correlation in A to temperature and the negative correlation in precipitation. So if it's cold and wet, the trees are not growing so well. Beach takes longer to put up the leaves, so spruce can be photosynthesizing because there's no shade, or there is less shade in the forest. After that, spruce is shaded anyway, so it just the variability doesn't um, affect it so much. All right. So I think this is really important on explaining why we find these mixed forests and, and uh, surviving here. Why is not one species out competing the other all the time? So one is climate or correlations. The other one was. Um, can we go back? Mm -hmm. Just a second. And one more. One more. One more. One more. There. So um, these low uh, rates of disturbances are favoring one species against the other. So are favoring beech against spruce, like uh, Nessie was saying. So if we disturb these forests and we have more release and more and more disturbances, then probably spruce will take uh, will have a bigger share in these forests. So the stability of this forest depends on not being disturbed too much. And in natural uh, circumstances, the, the disturbance rate is really low, so it keeps the species composition as it is. Of course, it will have higher and lower at different times. But it's really important to maintain and not disturb these forests with logging or building roads or things like that. All right, so uh, let me get this one to keep my Already? No? All right. So, one of the things that we usually deal with in the neurology is old trees don't grow fast, and fast growing trees don't grow old. That's you can have one or the other most of the times. So, in other many, many papers showing that. We see lifespan mm -hmm. against mean early growth. Mm -hmm. Oh, excuse me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What am I supposed to do? Share again? Yeah. All right, so we have low, so it's low growing trees, get old, and so on. Okay. Um, another thing is, as I was saying, these were sampling suppressed, codomina, intermediate, all kinds of trees, because we, if we only sample dominant trees, we are losing a lot of information, we're missing a lot of information on the carbon that is stored, for example, in suppressed trees. Here we have in the African forest understory, they have probably the longest um, mean carbon age of all the trees. They're the smallest trees. They may, maybe they don't grow for 60 years, for 50 years, but they accumulate carbon and they keep it there. And they're, they're alive. They can respond to disturbances. They can grow faster later. And of course, they can die as well. But they're keeping the carbon there, and it's a big carbon stock. But how does it look in our, in our type of forest? So again, uh, NPP comes in, the composition takes it out, and um, the difference is the stock inside. All right. The thing is, some carbon is fixed by photosynthesis. It can be released after two seconds. Uh, it can be released after a few days when um, uh, uh, some uh, insect eats a leaf. It can be uh, of, of every year, the leaves uh, of this seedless uh, uh, species, they fall and they, uh, they, they decompose after a few years or small twigs or something. But the big trees are holding, the big old trees may be holding it for centuries. But the thing is, so this is pretty easy to say, but how do we put numbers to these actual uh, residence time of this carbon? How long is carbon stored in the forest? Either suppressed trees, intermediate trees, or dominant. So there are uh, several ways to estimate that. We can estimate it. So we have been using two estimates. So one, one is a turnover time. So the stock divided by the flux, and the, so whatever comes in or whatever comes out. So we can use both of them, but uh, what we can, what comes out is really hard to estimate, if, uh, especially with dental technology, but we can estimate more the growth. So we can say, how long would it take 
build this uh, this uh, leaky bucket. So if we divide the stock by the NTP, then we have turnover rate. But we also good thing with uh, tray rings. Once the carbon is fixed, it's not going anywhere unless it decomposes. But let's assume that it doesn't. That all trees are solid because most are, and we can date. The rings, no, the, the biomass that was put uh, 20 years ago or 500 years ago, just by using algorithmic equations and theories. And we can have different ages in this bucket. So we not only know what comes in and what comes out, those are just two numbers here. We can have different, uh, different groups because they're not mixing. In the soil, they mix all the time because the organic matter mixes uh, because of. Uh, Different decomposing agents, but in trees, once it's fixed, it's set. So we did this study in a, this old growth forest in the in the north part of Spain. Again, we sample uh, all the trees within uh, with the forest. You can see it's more open, and it also shows here it's more open than the other other those kind of forests that we had. We sampled three plots, much slower uh, biomass than we had before, between two and four hundred, which is still not bad. And we have over 500 years of record of this uh, biomass increment. And they're very old trees, 550 years. So when we look at the, the um, age distribution of trees per hectare, we can see, of course, there's a lot of young trees. Well, well not so young. I mean, 100 years, but still uh, not so old either. But there is a big, long tail towards the end of So we have some trees that are 500, some that are 400, and then in the 300 year and the 200 year old, there's a lot of trees. This is the, that was the oldest tree, 550, five, so no, 568 years, and we didn't get to the fifth, so it's probably about 600 years, which makes it one of the oldest oaks dated. Again, we can uh, run this certain uh, regeneration, we see that there's not. Uh, Big peaks of regional disturbance, except for example, this one here, which agrees really well with the 100 um, year old tree classes that we, that we saw. But in general, it's dominated by very few trees being released every day. When we look at the biomass growth, it's really small, it's about maybe about, about a ton, so one mega, megagram per hectare per year, so it's not a lot. And of course, if we have a lot, a lot of biomass and low growth, we divide stock by a small amount, then we end up with high turnover rates. All right, between 150 or 130 years old. So if nothing died in that forest, if all carbon accumulated in that forest, it would take 150 to 130 years to fill that biomass in the forest. Then the thing is, is it a lot or is it not a lot. Is it uh, high estimate or is it low estimate? So we compare with published estimates of the same index and no. and we see that it's on the very high uh, range of uh, these turnover rates. And these are actually or were considered in these Killing and Phillips, uh, they were considered outliers. So they're actually on the outlier um, uh, range. So I think it's uh, Really interesting that these really unproductive forests, I mean, uh, one ton per hectare per, per, per year is not much, but it's uh, high turnover rates. And we can also estimate uh, the amount of carbon and uh, different class, age classes that we, uh, for that, for that uh, carbon. So of course, most of the carbon has been fixed in the recent years. I mean, that's not new. But we have some carbon that was fixed four to 500 years ago, and it's still there. How much? Well, it's about 20% of it was fixed 30 years, uh, 300 years ago. So if we had huge extensions of these old growth forests, which we don't. But if we had, we would have a long-term storage mm -hmm. of, of this carbon, all right? And, all right, so if we want to put this in a uh, more general perspective, now we put all of the data together and see how it what what what, it, what um, general features it, it shows? Oh, it's horrible. It's horrible. No. Anyway, so well anyway, I don't 
So we have this beach conifer forests and the oak forest. This is generally and the two sites in, in Spain. Anyway, we see that this is the fastest growing site and this is the lowest growing site. The amount of carbon that it's holding on the low growth site, it's low, of course, but it, it keeps it for the longest. So again, the same thing that happened with trees. If you grow, so the, if the forests are growing fast, they're not holding their carbon for too long. And if they're growing slow, they're, uh, they, they will hold it for longer. And now what we're working on is a uh, uh, bigger network. We have more plots here. We have collaborations with people in Finland and Eastern Europe and, and with Neil Peterson, like Matt has shown before, to extend this kind of analysis for to find these uh, general features on it. And uh, what we're showing for now is again, so you can have a lot of a lot of biomass with usually high increments or low biomass with sorry, low biomass with low increments. We you but we usually don't have it here or there. So you don't have high biomass or, no, sorry, you don't have low, so high biomass with low increments because it's really hard to accumulate 600. It would be great if we could do that. Yeah. And again, so the, 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 the lower you're growing, the older your carbon is. And for, not only for trees, but for forests themselves. All right, so here we have the oats on the Outlier kind of, um, and these are all the old growth forests, and this is this is the rest of the of the network, and we see the trend; it's clear and significant. Anyway, so what does the to finalize to finalize for you guys? So the thing is, these old growth forests are characterized usually by low disturbance rates, low to medium productivity. They cannot be really productive because the trees are old but still productive, which makes them uh, to reach higher longevities than uh, other uh, higher faster growing um, trees. And I think uh, some of the most important features is the high stability of the stock carbon. So if we don't affect that carbon, if we don't disturb this forest, they will hold the carbon for a long time. We don't have to cut them to make buildings or to make uh, uh, furniture with it to store that carbon. We can leave it there. It has a lot of other um, uh, ecosystem services. Uh, again, well, high ages of the, of the carbon and the importance for the global cycle. Oh, carbon cycle. If, if um, we had more and we protect these forests, uh, they will hold the carbon and you don't have to uh, uh, promote more reforestation to hold much less carbon for uh, shorter periods of time. So that's it. And sorry for talking about it. Thanks for that. Thank you. Thank you. Atta, can you? Yeah? Did I sit there? No, you should sit there. Be on the. Oh. Okay. On the screen? Yes. Okay. You can take this. No, no, just in case you find out who. All right. Thanks a lot. This was a lot of information. <laughs> so just breathe once and then uh, start asking questions to Dario. Take a message, it's really short. If you grow <laughs> slow, you get old. That's it. Like musicians, you fast by young. All right. Any questions? Is there any question online? Any questions? I have a lot of questions. <laughs> no, I don't. No. Um, the thing is, maybe more a comment than a question. Um, I like this bucket model a lot because I think it shows nicely that, um, I mean, your, your take home message was probably a different one, but a forest is not necessarily a carbon store, a place to um, uh, a carbon sink because it's actually going through um, on the very long time scales. And this is something that I think many people do not really realize. I and mean, we talk about, if we talk to the general public, forests are mostly considered as carbon sinks, which is maybe not so true on the long run. 
Yeah. At least maybe in the above ground part. And there was one thing I was wondering about. Um, you didn't talk about this, and you're probably not doing so much research on it. But um, what about the soils? I mean, they should accumulate on longer time scales than the forest. That's okay. And I don't think we know. And that's one of the points. So here, because we are lazy, so we focus on the on the easy part that is above ground layer that we see it and we can measure it easier. There are some people working on soils, but it's much harder. You have to use carbon dating to date the carbon soil. But of course, yeah, they accumulate carbon for much, much longer. But the good thing is old world forest with well-preserved soil that soil holds the carbon much longer than when we uh, disturb the forest because we increase uh, first solar irradiance on the, on the soil and temperature in the soil. So the if this disturbed forest, um, uh, the carbon in the soil decomposes faster in general and they can accumulate. So their ca the capacity to accumulate carbon is reduced. In so the above ground sink and the below ground sink go up a bit synchronized. Mm, okay. But we don't have estimates on that, and that would be a great thing to do in this. So comparing different preserve, so the, the, so forth with different uh, preservation stages. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but that could be on the thousand year range. I mean, the soil and the carbon, it's like a complete order of magnitude higher than than above ground. I mean, I, I was wondering about this before. Um, I haven't really tried to figure it out, but like the carbon, the CO2, atmospheric CO2 trend over the last 10,000 years was pretty much stable apart from a little increase since the last thousand years maybe. But I was always wondering why the soils you know, take up more um, from this atmospheric carbon so that it would slightly decrease in a warm, warmer climate state than in a colder one. They probably like they are working on much longer scales, so probably their uh, dynamic equilibrium also has these really long trends that are hard to see. No, and I mean this was not so much on your talk. <laughs> no, no, no. But it's a, I think it's a great thing. I mean, if somebody wants to take that from a soil perspective, I mean. um, am I the only one who wants to ask questions? Can I continue? Uh, Leon, yeah, yeah. Uh, I would like to say something to Dario. Yes. Uh, uh, Dario, I like the idea of all uh, the results you put together and show uh, the importance of all old growth uh, forests. It was really nice. And uh, I really would like to <laughs> read uh, the publication when it published. Sorry, I couldn't hear. I would like to write the publication too. It's not written yet. We haven't started yet. So. <laughs> you, you mean uh, not published, not written? <laughs> okay. Not yet. <laughs> not yet. Okay. Uh, this is this is very important for me to show the importance of uh, old growth forest again uh, with more one uh, one more publication because it is very hard to tell the uh, people uh, you know they just try to cut and grow uh, the new uh, forest uh, and earn more money but uh, we have to show them the importance of the old growth forest this is this this is very nice results uh, thank you so much uh, and maybe uh, the other side of the research, but I'm also wondering about the uh, fog effect of the uh, this um, Caucasus region uh, forest. How the fog affects the forest. Uh, this is related to temperature and pre pre precipitation effect too. But maybe. Uh, evet. Mikrofonu kontrol eder misiniz efendim? Sesinizi alamıyoruz. Ha. Öyle mi? Mikrofona bakar mısınız? Mikrofon açık. Ama donmuş. Ben de duyuyorum. Orada bir problem var herhalde hocam. Sesinizde herhangi bir problem yok. Evet aynen doğru buradaki bağlantı gitti. Ben de telefonumdan bağlanıyordum. Tamam şimdi oldu bir dakika. Tamam.
Bir dakika şimdi hallediyoruz. Alper beni duyabiliyor musun? Evet ben duyuyorum şu anda. Alper şöyle yapalım mı? Yemek e, molasına çıkalım. Çok uzatmayalım. <gülüyor> Öğleden sonra devam ederiz olur mu? Okey. Bir so söyle bunu. Tamam söylüyorum hemen. Okey. Ya ya. Tamam hocam. Okeylediler. Tamam en güzeli olur çünkü. Tamam, biz de problemi çözmüş oluruz yani. Tamam hadi bakalım afiyet olsun size. Görüşürüz. Bir dakika saat kararlaştırıyoruz. More than an hour. One and a half is okay. Yeah tell them to be back at two. Then we are already late with the schedule. Okay two is okay. Tamam. Hocam ikide buluşalım diyoruz. Bir buçuk saat mola veriyoruz. Tamam. Peki. Görüşürüz o zaman. Bay bay.